to jump into things. Uh, today, Daniel and I are hanging out with Spencer of Gila RPGs. Um, Spencer has a lot uh, under his belt in this world. Um, I just through looking through your um, itch and the stuff that uh, we saw at your booth at Gen Con, um, you, you've got a lot uh, that you've put out. It's pretty cool. You've got something like 20 or so games that you've put out. Is that accurate? It's something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I've stopped counting at this point. Well, and I was I skimming just... <laughs> through not just the content that you've created, but even the base system, You kind of your setting agnostic system of Lumen and Lumen 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, there's been, again, I was skimming through Itch to get a, a sense of it, but having lurked in your Discord and seen how you've done game jams and stuff and posted your games on Itch, there's over 100 like uh, third-party uh you know, things that have been published through Lumen or, or the other systems that you have. And like, it's really cool to see a lot come out from not, not a one man show, but you know, like at the end of the day, from what I understand, you're the person working on the rules text and putting like the heart and soul into these. So, um, can you just give me like a little bit of a history of how you got into this? And, and really after that, I want to know how the heck you're able to crank out so much because just, <laughs> Just since Gen Con, let me look mm -hmm. at what my notes were. It's it's been busy. Um, yeah, you did. Uh, so we you went to Gen Con having just released Hunt, and then you launched a Kickstarter for Reap. Um, you had the supplement for Hunt Pox come out. You've got a, a play test for Loot already out there, which I'm really excited to pour through. Um, and and then you just did the Zine series for Nova. Which, like, I don't know how you're able to get that much out of you. I'm fascinated by that. But, yeah, give me some of the history of Gila and yourself in, in the RPG space and uh, then maybe touch on how the heck you're able to do so much. I got into RPGs in grad school. That's when I started playing them. Uh, I The first group of people that I played RPGs with was my brother and a bunch of our friends in Chicago and my brother and... Yeah, many of his friends are Chicago improvisers, which if people are not familiar, Chicago improvisers are probably the best of the best. Uh, uh, they're outrageously good at what they do. And uh, they also make playing role-playing games a very unique experience. So I got started playing um, Powered by the Apocalypse games is how I started. Oh, I, didn't okay. start with, I didn't start with Dungeons and Dragons. I didn't play that for until years later. And wow. After having uh, played a bunch of other things that weren't D and D, I, like really made me realize how much I don't like D and D. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, so I started with PBTA games, and I started with this wild group of improvisers, and they absolutely. You know, I would come in with what I thought was you're supposed to do is prep a whole bunch of stuff, all these encounters, all this, all, the, and then of course. None of what I said or had planned was going to take place, which I think is a common experience for a lot of people. Yeah. But it was just yeah. really exaggerated with a bunch of improvisers who they would never want to have something written down like this. They want to just play yeah. it all off the cuff. And so I tell people this a lot that my experience playing with group as my first group to play with really like is stuck with me as a it kind of stuck into my like design philosophy of generally being pretty low prep pretty rules light and very much about interpreting things together at the table rather than being the gm is like the the like judge and ju judge jury executioner of all things it's a, it's a collaborative experience and so that's how i got started playing games and then truly like any GM, I was making stuff, right? Yeah, I think right. that's the natural course for most GMs is you're going to do some sort of homebrew or hacking or something like that for your games. So I was doing that as I was trying to run PBTA games and Blaze in the Dark uh, with another group. And so I was just making things for those games. And so I had I had been dabbling in the space of making stuff for other people, other people's games hacks. And I thought, hey, why not try and do this on my own? Just try making my own thing. But I was working on it, working on it. And then basically two things happened at the same time. Um, I learned about Zine Quest, which is the, mm. the like event that Kickstarter puts together for specifically funding 
zine sized role playing games. Uh, and then I also, uh, the pandemic happened. <laughs> <laughs> And so I said, well, this is a thing that I can, I can, I can comprehend making something at this scale, the zine size scale. And also now have a ridiculous amount of time in front of me to just sit and stare at a computer alone. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So those two things kind of happened together at the same time. I had already been working on this game, but this sort of just was the impetus to be like, okay, that zine quest happened the pandemic soon followed and i was like let me just i successfully funded in zine quest let me just keep trying this and it just kind of went from there it just uh snowballed and snowballed and snowballed and now we're i don't know about four years out and yeah like like you said i've i've been producing a lot of stuff since then and it's just been a hell of a time that actually makes a, a lot of sense what you said um with the improv group uh, because I've run Hunt twice now. Uh, I ran it for Andrew's birthday uh, specifically, uh, which was a ton of fun. And then I ran it for one of my groups because a couple players weren't going to make it. And I was like, well, we might as well use the time together. Uh, and, and they were so stressed out because they're like, what do you mean? We're going to play a new system? <laughs> we're going <laughs> to... Or this isn't fifth edition. Like, how does this work? What it's do I do? It's going to take me dice? four hours to make my character. And I was like, no, no, don't worry. <laughs> We're going to tell this story together. And one of my players panic uh, because he, <laughs> we're, we're 10 months into a campaign of Cypher. Uh, and he has yet to give me a backstory uh, for his character. <laughs> um, every now and then I get a couple notes like, hey, maybe I was from here. But with Hunt, he, for the first time, was able to just come up with things off the cusp. You know, one of the things is uh, you walk out of the gates and you look up and you see something flying overhead or what is it, right? And at first they were a little, but honestly, as an exercise for improv, fantastic yeah uh my players loved it um absolutely great <laughs> oh good yeah, yeah i that's... i had an absolute blast when we played hunt the first time like i had said i had read through it a bit and gotten familiar with some of the mechanics and it was fascinating to me to go yeah. oh my gosh this is diceless and this is resource management over randomness and right. um it it encompassed the improv idea of yes and right it was like uh, you can do it but there's gonna maybe be a minor consequence or there's gonna be a major consequence and the idea of allowing the players to get those moments as opposed to ever really having to resist it it's like no you can have this cool moment a hundred percent you have the ability to do it you're a competent character in this universe, yes, you get this moment. <laughs> right. Like that's, it has influenced a lot of uh, my own storytelling. And I ran a session last night in a Cypher game that DJ is playing in. And um, there was a guy that joined the campaign. You know, we're way into it, right? It goes, the players, uh, characters go up to tier six in Cypher and they're at tier five, right? Like we're, at, we're at the end game. <laughs> So he jumps in and it's his first session and he goes to describe his whole attack and stuff. And he's like ready for like a roll or whatever. I'm like, no, like you don't need a roll. Like this isn't, this is not a do or die moment where mechanically I need to resist this. This is a one-off attack. It's not a full on encounter. This is just a good moment. We're just going to narrate it. And like, he loved that freedom of knowing he wasn't going to mm -hmm. fail in this narrative moment. Because it was it was a low you know risk kind of situation, but it's really influenced a lot of that in myself in the, my GMing, and I've really enjoyed the freedom to just say like, look, you've got resources. How do you want to spend them? That's what's more right. important. Yeah. yeah, it gives them some fun like buttons and levers to think about pushing and pulling the whole thing. I'm glad you caught the whole concept of it fitting well with the idea of yes and right. Like it's mm. there's never a no when yeah, you're playing right. the game it's you can do it 
there will just always be some form of consequence to it, either via spending a resource or if you don't want to spend resources, some sort of complication is going to come your way. And the story, as a result, will always move forward, right? And that's yeah. like especially important right. in a one-shot game where things always move forward. Hunt isn't meant to be played throughout a campaign. So yeah. you don't want these situations where the player says, I do this, and you say no, and then this, <laughs> there's just this stop in story. The momentum <laughs> the, is all gone. I call them doors. You know, yeah. I go to pick the lock. It do You fail, okay? I go to bash the door down. You fail. Well, what do we do now? <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. Well, now you this suck. other character is going to try picking the door. You're like, okay, we're all going to try yeah. and pick the door until somebody <laughs> rolls correctly. <Group> effort. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. it's been really fun to, instead of like, you know, find ways to say no, right? Like that's never what you want to do as a GM, but it's been fun to go, okay, yeah, 100%, but I want to consider if I'm running other systems, I go, but what does this cost them? One is this just a narrative moment where it doesn't need to be a cost. Great. Keep moving. Right. Or is it a thing like, yeah, hundred percent, you can do that, but maybe I'm going to subvert a little bit of how the rules for this system works. And I'm just going to ask for this from you. It's like, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll spend that to perfectly succeed at what I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. It's really been fun to have that freedom. And, and like, there's a lot of, types of players where they're like i want a system that fully supports it so it's it's cool to have in lumen the idea of the approaches like in in how they're just kind of already spelled out in that way of like these are broad they're meant to be spent and they're part of this um at its core um right so on lumen i want to understand something so we played through hunt which is lumen 2.0 correct mm -hmm. um what are the big differences between what you first came up with with Lumen and then how did it shift um, it both like in your design philosophy and in the refining process of taking something and uh, and, and redeveloping it? Yeah, so Lumen was the technically the original Lumen game was light before Lumen existed. And light was where I had the concepts of the three approaches, the powers, the resources that you're spending, these bombastic powers. But Light didn't have concepts like the GM turn or the drops from enemies mm -hmm. and things like it. Because it was it was all originally Light just fit on one page, one, yeah. one sheet of paper. Like that was the original version. And then obviously it's, it's grown since then. Uh, but I wanted to expand on that. And so I made Frame and that didn't go so well. And then I made Lumen as a result of that. And Lumen was basically sort of distilling what I had learned from Light and Frame into a design philosophy of how I thought games were supposed to work, which is like wildly influenced by board games and video games. Yeah. That to me, I have the most fun role playing when role playing games have borrowed heavily from those two mediums. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is because those games generally are about what we talked about earlier, maintaining momentum, that you're just kind of going forward and forward and forward. Things are happening. Your characters feel competent. They feel badass oftentimes, at least in the games that I'm specifically referring heroic. to in a lot of my and, game. Yeah, heroic. You know, like in, whether it's high fantasy or sci-fi or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. And so for me, it was about coming up with a system that would allow you to do those sorts of things and very much so be fans of the play. Um, meaning, and, and that's a different thing between being a fan of the player and being a fan of the character, right? There's the concept of being fans of the characters, which means that you're not like directly just like lightning bolting characters to wipe them out and you're supporting the characters and like the narrative beats looking for, which I think is important. But then also there is being fans of the players, which are the people that are at the table with. And for me, that's incredibly important because I I so vehemently am opposed to the idea of like the the dichotomy of GM versus player sort of vibe that a lot of people have, obviously based off of what I was yeah, mentioning earlier. Right. And so I wanted to create a system then that was about supporting the players that made that gave them the tools to feel like they were playing the game really well that the yeah. game was going well for them while they were doing. Their characters were obviously doing super magic, amazing things, but they felt as players like I'm do. I figured out this super cool combo based right. off of what you just did. 
to do an awesome wow we just figured that out and like that's a player celebration yeah and that's where lumen sort of originally comes from is from finding those moments where you get to celebrate as a player of the game um and then it, it you know I, I played in that space for a long time in terms of designing games nova was the first big what i would call official lumen game and that it came very soon after it basically coincided with the release of lumen was was nova and what i learned very quickly is that i was already deviating from my own rules and this is what i learned for myself and everybody who made a lumen game is nobody ever made a lumen game rules as written <laughs> which is awesome honestly. yeah right. that's like exactly how i want inspiration it to be. which is why it's not I don't really like to call it an SRD, right? Because yeah. in SRD, the assumption is you literally copy and paste rules from this document and use them as the core verbiage in your document. The Lumen is written as a as what I call a creator kit. It's a yeah. design philosophy document and conversation between me and you as the reader. And you craft based off of whatever connects or resonates with you in the text. So Nova, right away... I don't have any rolling taking place in combat. There was rolling in light and everything like that. But in Nova, I was like, but what if you just did the powers? Wouldn't that be even <laughs> more fun? Uh, yeah, you can roll for the the stuff outside of combat. But in combat, shouldn't we just like be these really cool robots and it should just work? Yeah. And like I did that. Other people were already starting to deviate from the Lumen stuff. And I think that whole concept of not rolling in combat just, I mean, it stuck in my head for the longest time. And I realized that for me, that the, the whole, the freedom that comes from here are my choices and I get to make a choice and that's how combat's going to play out. I wanted to start to see how I could play with that outside. For, for a period of time, I was going to update Lumen to keep it with the dice and I was going to change the way that dice rolling worked. One to two was success with a terrible concept. Mm -hmm. so you could not fail <laughs> yeah. in the game you would always roll like you would roll yeah or succeed and instead of one of two just being failure because that's no fun we talked about that already it's instead you succeeded and you almost wish you hadn't succeeded <laughs> that's the sort of like what i had kind of anticipated as the next evolution of lumen so again the momentum is moving forward and it's all about consequences and, and weird things being thrown your way and I, I ultimately played in the space of going diceless because I found that even in in that and in plenty of other games that I was playing that weren't my games, I was just having a dissatisfying time calling on dice rolls. And just like there were so many games that I would play that have dice in them and I just we would never pick them up. And like I, you hear about those stories all the time about people who are like, we just had the best session of Dungeons and Dragons and nobody ever picked up the dice. And it's like, Okay, <laughs> so like, why are you playing Dungeons and yep. Dragons? Like, well, you it sounds like the game isn't doing maybe necessarily what you want. It sounds like there might be another game that fits more in line with what you all are seeking as a, at a table. And since I was realizing, I, I clocked for myself. I don't. I'm not having people reach for these dice very much. There's got to be a way that I can do this all mm -hmm. diceless. Um, and so that's sort of where the, the shift towards Lumen 2 emerged of finding ways to make this sort of resource pool system um, and, and, and hunt with the appropriate way to, to test it as a one-shot yeah. game, right? just to yeah. see, like, does it conceptually make sense? Does it, is it fun to play? And if it is, if it, then I can kind of engage with the idea of, are there legs to this right. system, like to, to this ship? Both times that I've run Hunt 2, um, it's it's crazy how wildly different the story was uh, between the two groups. You know, I'm reading the same document each time. Like, I haven't gotten to the bravery part of, like, you know, supplementing my own stuff in and out of it yet. But, like, just, you know, the stories people come up with for, like, oh, this is why the weapon was cursed, right? Or, you know... Um, the combat system in the end uh switching things up and yeah. uh i haven't i've yet to be able to kill a party uh so that's my goal <laughs> uh because i know that's that's well, but like uh, i know it's i know it should be possible i came really close <laughs> you really did. close uh in theirs uh yeah. so close 
but technicality, <laughs> not even a technicality, rules is written. Uh, one of the players was able to do their little charge, uh, mm. wiped out the HP, and he was like, cool, so like, can I pick up my buddies? And I was like, you're right there. <laughs> you can pick them up. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's great. It's, it's wonderful, right? Like Because the way you have it set up where it's, okay, the game master is going to go in between everybody's turn. Like, I was a lot less bored. Yeah. Right? Which is, you know, I love running all of the games that I run, but, like, I felt way more engaged yeah. because I was doing more things more often. It's being part I love that. Back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I think that when it comes to, like, the player experience with the hunt and then reading through these, it... It was one of those like moments where it clicked for me how much um, the rules got out of the way, right? Like I, I just was there telling a story, and and to DJ's point, it wasn't even the kind of story I'm used to telling when I would play Dungeons and Dragons or other systems. It was, it was much more. I'm on the same level as the GM right now for driving narrative mm -hmm. and special moments and stuff. And I was able to create those moments in a much more natural way. Um, and, and I loved that. And again, I'm trying yeah. to incorporate a lot more of that philosophy into my games mm -hmm. where it's not me sitting and prepping this epic narrative for my players to just watch. Right. But instead are, are deeply not just invested, but are, are contributing significant portions to it. To where it's it's much more sixty forty in their favor narratively. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what I've just realized is that people always infinitely. I can rely on people coming up with ideas that are cooler than me, and so like that's why every single game I do, I run like a game jam and go like, well, what do you want to make right. from it? And people make things, and I go, well, that is awesome. I never would have thought about. That. <laughs> yeah, and so. It's how I design games to allow other people to make things for them. It's how I run tables because I just know the players together, their minds by their powers combined will find a, an infinitely in more interesting story than whatever it is that I try to write ahead of time. And so it just that that whole concept just kind of like seeps into like every phase of my space in, in games. It's awesome. Yeah. I'll read is your kickstarter that you recently finished up uh tell us about that is that the one you were telling me about andrew the looter shooter no that's loot the, the one oh that's that loot okay the, he's play testing yeah but that one reap too. i want to hear about both was, of these yeah no reap <laughs> so from what i understand i've played a little bit of rune is is reap essentially like a six I, so i backed reap ma mainly just out of pure reflex because all of the art in your <laughs> games is so freaking cool. And so I'm like, good. this is awesome. Mm -hmm. I want it. Um, but from what I understand, it's a solo RPG with a very different theme from Rune. Rune being much more Dark Souls-y. Um, but yeah, feel free to uh, share a bit about Reap and, and how that kind of happened. Yeah, so uh, to, just to speak to the art, it's the it, what I'm really happy about is it's the same artist duo that did the art for Rune. So Eddie York, who did the cover for Rune, did the cover art for Reap, and then Charlie Ferguson Avery, who did the interior spot art for Rune, did it for Reap as well. I just like I, I would be in my mind like absurd to look to anybody else uh, yeah. for that particular type of game. And yeah, so Reap is basically a, a, if you will, of Rune. So it's a solo RPG, and it has the same sort of concepts of there are sort of these two phases of play. You're exploring these point crawl maps, these sort of individualized realms or worlds that are full of nasty, horrible things. As you go to these point crawls, you're looting, you're searching, you're learning about things. Very Dark Souls-esque. I'm not overtly telling you a story, but you're putting the story together through... Mm -hmm weird little flavor text blurbs and things like that, which is honestly the the fun part of storytelling for me with from soft games is I you have no idea what right. the hell is going on and you have to kind of like put it together and that's that's fun for me. And then it dives into this very tactical, cool combat that takes place. Reap is on a five by five grid, so it's a little bit bigger than the four by four that mm -hmm. Rune was. And that's intentional because Reap is thematically about a necromancer 
it's in the same world as Rune, but it's further in the time. So Rune represents a world that is currently shattering and falling apart. Reap represents the that world is essentially dead. It's a corpse. Um, and you are the a necromancer who kind of wanders that corpse, reaping the souls of some of the, the worst horrors that the world still has kind of so cool. clotting around on the surface. And so it's in vibes wise is pretty grim. You're in you're this necromancer going around ripping souls out of bodies. And it has some mechanical deviations from rune in that it, it, it emphasizes like spell casting because you're a cool necromancer. That's why the board is a little bit bigger because it's about more like ranged combat than like the sword and board right. that you would typically see in rune. And also sort of vibes wise, you are like way more powerful in Reap than you are in Rune. Rune is meant to be the love letter to Souls like game, so you're gonna die a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> combat in Rune is hard yeah. and it's intentionally <laughs> intentionally so. Reap is it can be hard, but it is absolutely meant to make you feel like you are one of the last powerful people left on this world and you are here to kind of like clean house to like get rid of the the baddies. And so it will you in reap will feel more powerful and also kind of that idea that i mentioned earlier about like finding interesting combos and stuff that's what reap is all about is finding out these weird combinations of spells that you can pull up to have these like devastating rounds of combat um you're literally reaping like the blood bone and bodies of your enemies and using those spell components to like enhance your spells so like you can like, like infuse one of your spells with blood and it becomes way gnarlier and That's more awesome. powerful super metal um <laughs> yeah. so yeah it's 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 in a way it's a rune hack anybody who's played rune it will yeah. feel very familiar there's some new there's mostly new stuff that wasn't in rune and then just some slight tweaks to what you might be used to for rune in terms of the the flow of the game but anybody who's familiar with rune will feel very comfortable with reap but you don't have to have played rune in order to play reap I think what's really cool, and and you you're not shy about uh, the influence, um, but what's really cool is when I sat down to play Rune, I was totally overwhelmed by it in in concept, mm -hmm. and then when I started playing it, I was like, "This is well, it's not easy." Let me be clear, it's not <laughs> easy. I was, but it was so easy <laughs> to play it, and I was like, "Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, I'm just hanging out with myself." It was it was very wonderful for my much more introverted side to just like when I I'm a, I mean I'm a dad so I'm I rarely get this time but just to sit down with a book and be able to just like mess around and to your point of of a Dark Souls game to kind of wander without Jeez. reading huge portions of like lore which is kind of mm -hmm. what I expected I was like oh I'm going to be reading a lot it's going to be much more because it was actually my first solo RPG. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was expecting to have much more of a choose-your-own-adventure kind of thing. And as I was getting through the book, I'm like, that's not this at all. And mm -hmm. it was much more, like you said, much more board game influenced and yeah. much more tactical. And it really scratched that itch. It just felt like I was sitting there playing like an indie RPG on the Switch kind of thing. And it was really satisfying. And I obviously died a lot um <laughs> but then to it, there were two things that were really cool and this this again goes to what you've been able to foster as a creator i got to the end of it and i was like that was dope and i went there's no more realms in this book and i was like <laughs> dang it and so <laughs> then i like went and checked on itch saw that you had like what is it called a world guide or a realms guide the realm atlas there yeah. we go realm atlas I saw that there was more there, and then I saw there was a bunch that other people had created. And I was, I loved how the, what you've done in your creation is is generally so inspiring that people are able to just play with it quickly. And it's in a lot of the books that you put out, everyone that I've heard you talk about, that I've read the description of, you have a very like explicit talent to make something like simple and really evocative. And I envy that like so much because I feel like I have to say a lot sometimes to get an idea across, but you're able to do so like just take the names of your games, right? They're one yeah, words. Yeah. 
You know, like, <laughs> and then like, and then your new game loot. I don't need to understand that that you're influenced by like Borderlands and looter shooters and all this stuff. When I see I see the cover, I understand the idea of hoarding loot, and I'm here for it. Right. So like. <laughs> I'm really impressed by that. So just to throw compliments your way, but I think what I want to get an idea of is on all of my homebrew and my creative projects in writing, like I'm very much an aspiring um, designer in this space. Like I want to put together like similar scale books of my own concepts and things that I've worked on. I, for the life of me, cannot keep things concise. It feels like. Right. And so I, I'm really curious about that side of things for you. Like when you talk about reap, it sounds like in a lot of ways, an expanded idea of what happened when you made room, but Mm -hmm. it sounds like you've done some strategic things to control your design philosophies, um, to make something that works. Like you said, with hunt to then right. redevelop Lumen 2.0 further. So could you speak to that a little bit? I'm curious. <laughs> yeah. And so when I, my very first game score, I think I look back at it and it's, it's a fine game. I have no idea how it got nominated for an any for best rules. Cause I look at it now and I'm like, it isn't. <laughs> it's not that. It's like overdeveloped. And I think a lot of my early stuff was either like super not developed or overcooked uh-huh. to a certain degree in terms of, stuff and it wasn't until like i think a couple of things started to to shift how i how i did my design work to kind of simplify it and the there the things that jumped to my mind are first of all i got an editor mm. i work with will yopst who is probably one of the greatest people in the indie rpg scene in general they're just a truly wonderful person but also will is a designer himself and in just a top-notch editor mm-hmm. and will has edited every game that i have an editor on and as a result they know what i'm trying to accomplish in text and just so they can anticipate my wordiness and then find ways to make it look better so hire an editor editor is <laughs> is number one you know if the budget sort of uh, if it if it allows and then for me the other two things that kind of come to mind are one be, again, because my influence in uh, or my major influences are video games and board games. I look at you know how board game rule books are written, and they are the good ones are straightforward. Mm-hmm. They they cut to the point. They tell you exactly what they're about. They give you the rules of play, and then they want you to be playing the game as soon as possible. Right. And so uh, it's very much what I'm going for as well. Where it's like, okay, I, I, if I think about this as just the manual of a board game or the tutorial level of a video game you just here's what you absolutely need to know go play i trust that you will be able to kind of fill in the gaps moving forward and that's a big sort of third component there which is that trust in the team knowing that by and large most folks will will understand that they're going to run into situations where they don't know exactly what to do but they can resolve it together as a team i believe in them and <laughs> their ability to do that and so I don't need to kind of go on and on and on and try and cover every possible edge case and over over describe and over design particular things. Uh, so I think those are kind of the the big things. I also do a lot of design on stream, and I think that helps me because I do it mostly in bullet points. And so by starting with bullet points, I just have like this is the thing, this is the other thing, this is the other thing, and then just expanding those bullet points rather than just word vomiting onto the page where if I do that, it's just going to go and go and go. Yeah. I'm curious uh, about, so something like loot, right? I, I haven't dove into the play test material yet. Um, but as a huge fan of looter shooters um, <laughs> and really you know, the idea <laughs> of just like gathering all the cool loot, right. And trying stuff mm-hmm. out. I'm curious how you adapted that, which sounds like the most insane, overwhelming thing to ever adapt for <laughs> tabletop, and we're able to make something much more succinct. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll see if people like it. That's, that's sure. why it's in play does right. I think the loot system in loot is really cool. 
I don't know if people will actually enjoy it or think it's too funny. Hmm. Basically, it's a, it's a concept that I had originally planned on using on, in light a long time ago, because light's based off of Destiny. It's a looter shooter. And so, but I didn't use it there. And basically, there's a deck of cards that is the loot, the, the current loot pool. You as players are going to be feeding cards into that loot pool based off of like who you're working on or who you're working with and um, the types of uh, job or quests that you're going on. Very much like in Destiny, if you're going to go for a particular weapon, you're going to grind a particular faction or something like that to increase the odds that you pull from that pool. And then at the end of the session, at the end of the quest, the GM takes that deck, shuffles it up, and deals out a shit ton of loot, and then that's the loot that's explosion cool. at the that's end. Fun. And it, yeah. it gets divided up. And maybe you fed the thing that you're looking right. for into the deck, and it got pulled, but maybe you didn't. And if it didn't, it's still in there. And so now you know, okay, we just got to do another quest, and there's another chance that that, that loot is going to come bursting out of the loot awesome. chest or whatever at yeah. the end of the quest. And the reason it's all all about that is because literally like everything about your character is defined by the loot you have. You're yes. basically like a paper doll. So yeah. you don't really have powers like a Lumen game or anything like that. You literally get it all from the stuff that you're wearing, including like your hit points. So like yeah. if you don't have any hit points on it, the gear you're wearing, you're dead. Like you need <laughs> to put on at least a piece of gear that like gives you hit points. Right. Um so I wanted to make the game entirely about the loot and I wanted it to be about the chase of loot yeah. and that that fun of oh my god is that really badass sword that we know got it got put in there because we oh, worked okay. our way up through the thieves guild and they put in this super right. sick dagger in there like is this the time we earned the thieves guild dagger or yeah no oh man we got we got some stuff yeah. but it wasn't what we want we got to go do another quest right away. right um it, the goal again is not for this to be long connected stories of campaigns and things like that it's these fast like tight experiences of the quest where you're like right. this is where we're going and this is what we're going to do today and it might be part of like a broader story or connection but it's mostly just here are just these one and done quests that you're doing and the the, the loot shower that you get after each one yeah that's awesome i as a uh, avid player of destiny um was literally playing before at the interview um <laughs> the thing i've actually been I, like loot has always kind of been that problem for me because i so desire as a gm to just give out so much crap and it's a common problem you give out a bunch of magic items and all of a sudden your players completely break any balance in the game right so like it's fascinating that you're able to at least start playing with that problem and and how the players able to influence that um that's that's really cool i'm excited to check that out i'm I'm currently my my current destiny uh pull that I want to try and reverse engineer is much more related to like raid mechanics um and like mm. even ad clearing right like so it's an action economy problem I think um but I don't right. want to get too granular and so I'm playing around with like how can I create more opportunities for a player to do like 10 things on their turn right without it being this overly meticulous thing they have to choose. Um, but yeah, it's it's fun to hear uh, the inspiration from Destiny on, on loot, and even on, back on light, um, I'm also a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very fond memories of Borderlands and just yeah. kill a boss, and literally just loot just comes showering yep. out of the sky. Awesome. Like, what a great feeling Rain this down. is. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's awesome. that's, that's more my style as far as looter shooter goes is, is, is going to be the destiny um uh yeah i it's good stuff it's, it's good rewarding stuff. <laughs> and, and that's the big thing right is like you want your players to feel rewarded mm -hmm. right and there are so many sessions where you know yeah sure the story was probably great and on point you know and the role play was good and stuff but like Sometimes players are just like, I want things. Where's my stuff? I want a shiny thing. Where's the shiny? The yeah. Thing. Did we get XP? Did we get XP? Did it... This is DJ at the end of last session. Last but night. did we get XP? Did we get XP? I'm like, yes, one second. Let me finish my Reward notes. Reward me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, we, when we were at Gen Con, 
uh, I, re- I remember specifically uh, we were walking around the show showroom floor for a couple days. Andrew was just like, he went in knowing he wanted to buy something, right? <laughs> he was like, not just I, like I, I've I, got a ton of money to blow. Yeah, it was like, I, I want to find something buy. I'm excited about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I ended up, I, I bought like old gods of Appalachia, you know, that cause I, we've been playing a lot of cypher and stuff. And, uh, for him, you know, he, he just hadn't found anything. Uh, but then we were just walking and then like your, the design of your book covers caught his eye. Cause he, as he mentioned, he's kind of got a background and not kind of, he's, he's a graphic <laughs> designer. So like pretty images, <laughs> <laughs> is a yeah. huge draw. Ooh, shiny. Uh, and honestly, out of most things that I've seen released <laughs> over the past couple years, like the Gila RPG covers are some of the most beautiful, simple, and like just well designed. Um, it really draws me into it so well. Uh, so Pat, that guy on the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah, killer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, so like you know, working with Eddie, who did Nova, he did the Nova cover, he did Rune's cover, and he did Reap's cover. Uh, you know, Eddie and I basically landed early on on these books are going to be basically like a single cup. Color. like there's yeah. a theme color right. so nova is red then sort of like the teal blue of rune and then he wanted to go black and on reap and at first i was like oh i don't know. like i thought we were supposed to have the single color and then he <laughs> showed me i was like no you were right you were you, i don't know why i ever thought i should question yeah. your idea and then um mike my buddy mike reeman who was at the booth at yeah. gen con and he did he did the art and layout for Slayers and the Almanac and a whole bunch of stuff, but he also did the cover and layout of Hunt. Yeah. I think Hunt's cover is, I think it has magic powers. It's because <laughs> killer. It pulled that's me the in. One, that's the one we, you know, we were just at PAX and we strategically placed a, a copy of Hunt so that it was facing every possible angle that somebody could be approaching <laughs> our booth. Because we know that that's the yeah. cover. Someone's going to look at it and go, well, hold what on a that? second. Let me take a look at yeah. this. Yeah. And, oh, my God. That cover in particular is, I know we're not supposed to have favorite children, but that's my favorite <laughs> child. Like, I, Mike just unbelievably knocked it out of the park with Hunt. And mm. uh, it's yeah, and it's like that design philosophy. Gets his kudos. Uh, it's like the design philosophy of just sim- the simplicity, but it also it's elegant, it's intentional. It helps set the tone in such a cool way. The way that like I'm looking over it, but like the way that like the swords ruined and like the way that the game itself is kind of lonely. And like there's so many mm-hmm. things about the the actual game that come through in the cover once you've read it. But it also is just a striking looking cool yeah. piece of typography and graphic work. And uh, that's not common. I mean, uh, not to take pot shots or anything, because there is actually fan like fabulous art in these instances. But you look at Dungeons and Dragons covers, and they're deeply, deeply illustrated, like yeah. often traditional pieces of art accompanied by graphics and sometimes a stamp or like a you know like there's so much clutter, yeah. and I think that you've been able to kind of curate much more of a not column, but like it's just like a clear cut message with a lot of the visual design that you've brought to these books with the the teammates that you pulled on. And yeah, I think that just flipping through them is fun because that, that art is consistent throughout and it's, it's so tonal. Um, and so I think that you really did a, a killer job with that. Uh, Pulling your team and they together, good together. Yeah, like, they do. Yeah, like as as a set, right? They, you know, yeah, the the colors may not be all perfectly aligned, but like design wise, yeah. it, like they look good on a shelf, which yeah. I appreciate. I mean, I think you appreciate too. I'm looking behind you, and I see <laughs> all of the you know various board games and TTRPGs that you have, and it's like I love having like 
the books. Yeah. However, mm. I want my books to look good on the shelf and classy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and it's like so many of the games that we run these days, like DJ and I used to play games in person. Now we're in different cities and we don't. Yeah. And it's like, I, I love having the tactile book. So I so appreciate that you actually do your printed material. And I love the quality of the books that you have. Um, and I tend to buy physical copies as much as possible, but I end up using yeah. PDFs and stuff all the time for so many of the systems. But it's clear you put a lot into the books themselves. Um, so I, I want to respect your time here, but um, I uh, I'm really curious with with like your um, speed that you're moving. You, you're putting so many <laughs> things out. Um, how? like two two questions so one how many things just go in the trash like of these projects how quick are you cranking these things out you're a full-time professor you know you're you're busy <laughs> and then on top of that like i said i've read off the list just since gen con right uh you've been busy so i'm curious yeah. how what is your curation process of like this idea is worth pursuing or this one's going in the bin um i don't have many that go just to the bin what I, you know, I have a lot that live in drafts and drafts and drafts and drafts. And what I find is that I will go back and reread things from time to time and find that, yeah, largely I, I've stopped working on that because of X, Y, and Z reasons, but there's still something in there that I want to take. And so that I, I grab something from, there are definitely plenty of projects where it's like, okay, I, I, I tried, I tried, I tried. And then it's like, okay, I just don't think this is going to go anywhere. Let's just. Let's just kind of set this aside and be be done with it. Um, for me, when it comes to like the curating in terms of like what I'm gonna work on or or things like, it's really it's hard. Like in the beginning, it was just whatever idea was in my head. It was the thing that I was working on. Did it nonstop. So like, Corvid Court, which is one of my first games, was something I wrote in 48 hours because I was like, I just gotta get this idea about mm -hmm. bird people doing out of my head and. <laughs> Uh, and that it just happened. And like Null was like that too, where it was like I had this idea and I wrote it in like two days and I just I got it done on the page. And then there's others that are like much long, much longer that process. And it's figuring out sort of where they fit in scope of my excitement. That I mean that's largely what yeah. just kind of is the thing right. that I pick is like the things that I'm most excited about. I tried for a period of time to have like a like a practical release schedule where I thought like, okay, let me sort of map out when I should release these things. And that will give me a sense of like, okay, you're going to work on this for these months and then this, you know, you'll yeah. move on. And I just, I've learned that I don't work. And the more <laughs> I try to control the process, the the less I do as a result. Yeah. I just don't, don't write. There was a finally feel like I freed myself from it. Like I have for the longest time wanted to do a lot more with Nova and the world of Nova, but I had these, like I'd set myself to these plans of what I thought was going to be this release pattern of these things. And as a result, I stopped myself from pursuing other ideas that were related that I was excited about. I said, no, 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 that doesn't fit the timeline that you have for yourself. Mm. And, and that, uh, and so that was, I was essentially punishing myself. I was, I was like shackling myself to idea and not allowing myself to do the other things. And so what I have found is that I have, I, I destroyed that concept yeah. of, okay, this is the, the timeline and things like that. And that it will be in bursts and fits like this year. I know you rattled off a bunch of things, but to me, the way I perceive this year is that it was a slow year. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> That's <is> crazy. <laughs> it feels like yeah. a slow year to me compared to like last year. Uh -huh. And I have like these, now I have all these wild aspirations of what 2024 are going to look like because I've made all these play tests. And so those are yeah. just sort of the next things to move on. And the, I think that ultimately is best for me to do it this way about what I'm most excited about. But what the one downside to it is that I, I forget about projects. So yeah. Like, I forgot about the Gila hack for a long time. Yeah. And it wasn't until I printed it and started giving it out to people at so that I read it again. I went, Oh shit, this is actually good. And I like <laughs> I need to actually follow through on this thing. And 
and do something about it. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I, I read through a design doc from months ago. Why did I like <laughs> what? Why did I stop working on <laughs> right. this? And it's usually not nine times out of 10 when I stop working on something, it's not because I go, this isn't viable. This yeah. isn't, I'm not liking this. It's because I get immediately distracted by something else. And then I forget about ADD is a bitch, man. <laughs> yeah. So like now I've got like, I have a, a doc that I try to use to, to like almost purely as like a reminder yeah. doc for myself to be like, Hey, don't forget. Yeah. These things exist and you should just check in on them from time to time. Right. Uh, and that has been, has been helpful for me yeah. in terms of, get myself back on track but i don't know like the whole process is just i just let myself be excited about that's awesome. the thing and when i'm excited about it, i make a good game and when i'm excited about it i'm trying to force it it is agony and it usually isn't very good as a result yeah i mean andrew and i are both uh writing settings uh you know andrew's doing some r- r- like custom rule things and he, he was talking about it today, and he's like, man, I haven't touched any of that in a few weeks. And I was like, yeah. I also have not, honestly. Uh, but then I go back to it, and I look at it, and I'm like, oh, cool. So this needs to change. But yeah. like this, this part is great. <laughs> I don't and know so what it's I was like, thinking it's like, here. Whoa. <laughs> and so it's like almost having time away from my projects and then going to work on another project and stepping back it could be my adhd uh it's probably my adhd but like (laughs) coming back to it like you know it's you really kind of find the nuggets Mm -hmm. of where things were going right right but more importantly you see the places where things were going wrong um Mm. so yeah that's that's definitely been what's been working for me so hearing that affirming <laughs> there you go <laughs> there you go <laughs> awesome well thank you so much for hanging out with us spencer it's been a joy to not only dive into your games but to kind of hear the behind the screen uh viewpoint from the author itself um so thank you so much uh we're excited to play your games more and see whatever is uh next if uh, i'd love to turn it over to you if there's anything you want to share with our listeners and viewers um, where they can, uh, you know, like engage with you next, anything coming up that you want to point towards specifically? Yeah, well, first of all, again, thank you so much for having me on. This was this was really a lot of fun. Just I love talking shop like this. It's just <laughs> yeah. fun to me. Uh, um, I also find that it helps me to like articulate. I do the things right. I do because sometimes I like it's in your head but it's until not until you say it you go like oh yeah that's that's what i actually think <laughs> i'm a genius <laughs> i meant that <laughs> not the whole time <laughs> so i always appreciate a chance yeah. to try and like solidify my ideas from the nebulous space inside my in terms of finding me online or or what i'm up to i think the best place to to do that is just to go to to gilarpg.com and that's where you can find links to like my Shopify page where books are sold or my itch page where you can get the PDFs of things. It's where you can get you can sign up for my mailing list, which I like send once a month if I remember. Uh, but that's a good way to sort of stay up to date with the, the things I'm working on. Um, I think what I've also learned that a good way to keep up with what people are doing is to follow them on itch. Uh, because then you get like what they're releasing in your feed on itch. And right. that's. Because I've virtually stepped away from most social media. I, I don't like being on Twitter. I find it terrifying and horrible. And I only go there to like post promo stuff for the most part. And so I've lost the ability to see what my friends are making. I don't know what anybody's making. And so I've actually found that following them on itch helps because then I go, oh, cool. Adam Bell just today released a murder mystery thing. And I wouldn't have known that. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Followed awesome. him in on, on itch. So. Uh, that's my that's my secret hint to you is go follow all your favorite creators on itch because that's how you're going to fe- see what they're actually releasing when they're releasing very cool very cool well thank you so much again for coming and hanging out and uh i look forward to trying loot soon <laughs> yeah yeah i can't wait to hear you <laughs> for sure <laughs> Hey guys, thank you so much for listening along. It was an insane pleasure to be able to talk to Spencer from Guild RPGs, and uh, we really hope you enjoyed the chat. 
listen, the best way that you can follow along and support Spencer is to check out his itch. Um, they've got amazing games available for you right now to download yeah. in PDF as well as order physical copies. And for us, please continue to follow on TikTok, on YouTube, as well as um, everywhere else. And uh, the, the best way for you to support us is to join on our Patreon. Now, what do you get when you're joining on the Patreon practically? Mainly, you're supporting us. But um, in the asset department, we are producing actual plays of the games that we are going through and demo demoing for the different episodes that we're doing. So please take a look at our Patreon. Drop us five bucks a month that gives you access to the actual plays as well as other exclusives that we'll be rolling out over time. And thank you so much for listening to this episode. We'll see you on the next one.